we thank you for this. This morning, free our hearts, loosen our tongues that we might give worthy praise to the one who paid it all, who made the way, who went before us. May we lift up the name of Jesus. Give him all the glory. We ask, Father, as we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson for this morning is taken from Psalm 118. the words of the psalmist. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let Israel... Sorry. <laughs> I can't blame her. This is, was meant to be read antiphonally, but... <laughs> Thank you, dear. I pre... It really gets across the idea. Let's start. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let Israel now say, his mercy endures forever. Let the house of Aaron now say, let his mercy endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord now say, his mercy endures forever. I called on the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I shall see my desire on those who hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. All nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They surrounded me. Yes, they surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They surrounded me like bees. They were quenched like the fire of thorns. For in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. You pushed me violently that I might fall. But the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the trees of righteousness. The right hand of the Lord has, does valiantly. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me severely but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go through them, and I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. I will praise you, for you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I'll praise you. You are my God, I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Amen. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Now, Pastor Steve is going to come and bring us our morning announcements. 
So I'm pretty sure you picked up on the fact that's a messianic psalm. So when you get a chance, go back over it and read it in light of what Christ faced when he went to the cross um, and all throughout his ministry, but especially when he was um, tortured, beaten up, and executed. So, so as, uh, as far as some announcements, here we go. Um, no evening service, everybody, so uh, don't forget that. Um, also, I wanted to mention, um, we're not having our youth tonight with the, um, the Bible Adventure Club and the God Squad, but again, we will pick that up again next week. But if you have young people in that age uh, category, kindergartners up to sixth grade and then seventh up to twelfth grade or, or something like that, let's see, I think it's in the back here specifically, um, yeah, sixth to twelfth. Uh, invite them out to this. Every Sunday night at 6 o'clock, we have a meal for them, and then they have some fun activities, and then we, we teach them about the Lord right out of the Bible. So if you have children that you know of in that, uh, those ages, uh, bring them out. We'd love to have as many as we can to come out and minister to them and love them and give them a great place to go to and enjoy uh, one another. So uh, don't forget that. And brothers and sisters, let's keep that in, in our prayers regularly. Uh, also, we are scheduling a church work and cleanup day on a Saturday. That's April the 20th at 8 in the morning. Um, we invite anybody and everybody to come out to help us get this place ship shape, spruced up, some maintenance kinds of things that we'll be doing. And uh, we have a whole list of things, so come on out. We've got something that we can assign to just about anybody that comes. So that is April 19th, I'm sorry, April 18th uh, at 9. Wait, I've got two different... No Wait a minute, I'm, my eye has fallen on the wrong one. April 20th, Saturday. Now, pause, moving on. Teenagers, our teenagers, that's those who are, say, 55-year-olders and on up, retirees. Um, we'll be meeting in the senior high room April 18th, which would then be a Thursday at 9 in the morning, and we're headed out to Shady Maple. If you've ever heard of that place. Um... And then I wanted to mention another, right in that same week, um, our sister Nancy Moza went home to be with the Lord recently, and we've scheduled her memorial service to be here on April the 19th, which is Friday, uh, calling hours or viewing hours at 10, and we're going to have a memorial service at 11. And we have a sign up in the Narthex, we'd like to provide a luncheon for the family. Now remember, this is, this is not open to the public. Uh, this is a memorial service followed by a luncheon for the family and uh, family members and, and dear friends are invited to that. Um, but if you can, help us out. We want to supply uh, the food and, and all of that to them as a church, as, as Nancy's church family. So there's a sign up for that uh, in the narthex. So on your way out, don't forget to sign up for that. Those of you who'd be willing to help us out. And then at the bottom of that inside page, we want to thank everybody. Let me just read this. Thanks to all of you who contributed to our food pantry for Sunday night children and youth ministry dinners. You've made this part of our ministry so much easier, absolutely. Because of your generos generosity, our, pan our food pantry is full, and we're, we're coming to the end of the season for this ministry, and it's still full. And we don't need any more contributions at this time. Isn't that something? Yeah. May 5th will be our last meeting. They're planning some fantastic final meeting. And then we want to plan some events during the summer to keep everybody in touch with each other. So keep praying for that. And then we will let you know in the fall when the pantry needs to be replenished. So thank you so very much for stepping up and taking care of that, that need. Um, also in the bulletin is this insert. So ladies, we're having this great retreat coming up. Uh, it's at the end of this uh, coming month of April. Um, all the dates, the information is there for you, and there will be somebody who uh, will collect what you can sign up for and, and collect any, any money you want to give to that um, already. So um, looking forward to that. Um, I'm not allowed to go to it, but I'm still looking forward to it and be praying for all of you that are going. And then we'll have our men's retreat in November. So we have a speaker scheduled for that. And, We'll let you more, know more about that when we get closer to it. So we have a key verse that's at the bottom of the order of service, Galatians 2, 20 and 21. We say the reference, then we'll say the verse together as God's family, so let's do it. 
Galatians 2, 20, 21. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And I, life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness came through the law, then Christ died in vain. Amen. Sorry about my mix-ups there. All right, we worship the Lord with our gifts and our offerings, and a little bit, a few minutes with our voices as well, so let's uh, prepare for the ushers to come up. like these flowers, everybody. Thank you for these flowers, too, by the way. After the service, you, you can take your flowers. I think each one has the appropriate name on it for you to take. So look for the one with your name on it, because I, I want to take mine home. And <laughs> you can take yours home, but don't take mine home, all right? All right, we're going to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Son, Holy Ghost, we thank you for this day that you have set aside for us, that you have given a day that has proclaimed our salvation through the fact that he is risen. Mm. May we now return a proportion of the prosperity that you have provided for us that it may be used to spread that wonderful name of Jesus. In your holy name, amen. Amen. Uh, to the song I'm about to sing. It's called, It's About the Cross. I became, first became aware of it from a Facebook posting by Alice Andrews. So Alice, if you're watching, hello. <laughs> uh, last Christmas, Ken Farrell and I got together and we uh, composed a poem for our Christmas banquet. And the last lines of the poem go something like this. For unto us a child is born, we sigh, because this child was born to die. Across that Christmas manger is the shadow of the cross. He came. about the manger where the baby lay. It's not all about the angels who sang for him that day. It's not all about the shepherds, the bright and shining star. It's not all about the wise men traveled from it's about the cross, it's about my sin, it's about how Jesus came to be born once so that we can be born again. It's about the stone that was rolled away. about 
the good things in this life I've done. It's not all about the treasures or the accolades I've won. It's not all about the righteousness that I find in you. It's all about his precious blood that saved me from my sin. It's about the a little turned around. Uh, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Right response. Today's uh, responsive reading is going to be found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 to 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 to 20. We're going to be reading from the New King James Version. If you don't happen to have that Bible, we do have copies in the pew racks. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 20. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand. By which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. And that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures. And that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained in his presence, but some after that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. And then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach and so we believed. Now Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead. How do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? 
But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we are grateful that we have a living hope because we have a living Savior, that Christ has risen, death is conquered, the grave is rendered ineffective, and we look forward to eternity with our Savior. As we live in this world, Father, we pray that we would be more and more made like Jesus. We ask that your Holy Spirit would conform us to the image of your Son. And that we might grow up in every way into what Paul describes as that full measure of his stature. That seems inconceivable, and yet, that's your purpose for us. Work in us, make us like Jesus, use us. Father, we pray for your people who are gathering all around the world this day. We pray that they they would be able to really enjoy their salvation, that their gathering would be a testimony to the lost, that their lives would bring hope to the hopeless. Father, we don't want to revel in it just for our benefit, but you sent your son that he might redeem the world. Help us to preach Christ. Help us to model him to our brothers and sisters in the church and to the world outside watching. Use us. Glorify the Son, we ask, by the things we say and the things we do. And Lord, we would like to remember those who are experiencing special needs at this time. We think especially of our brothers Gary and Jim Watch over them as they are dealing with life-changing illness. Be their companion. Raise them up and strengthen them, we'd ask. Lord, we think of our sister Nancy and her family. Lord, we thank you that she is seeing Jesus right now and that her exaltation is in his presence. But Father, for those who remain behind and miss her, we pray that you would bring peace and the comfort of the Holy Spirit who would not only ease the sorrow of her going home, but would point her friends, her relatives to the same Savior that welcomed her into his presence. So, Lord, use even this time of loss. 
Lord, we live in a dangerous world. Every day we hear of atrocities. Father, the ISIS attack in Russia, the assaults that are going on on both sides in Gaza, we can be very mean to other people. It seems to be in the nature of fallen humanity to hurt those that disagree with us, that are different than us. Lord, we pray that you would work and bring peace to this world through the gospel of Jesus. Only he can bring real change. And so we pray for these places where there's conflict that the gospel would affect hope and peace and life. You've told us that we should pray for those who are in authority over us. And we think of those who are meeting in our Senate and our Congress who are deliberating different decisions, who are trusted with the care of our nation, guide them, direct them. May they administer their public trust in true righteousness with your word in mind. Father, we think of our gospel laborers, especially we think of our brother Daniel in Argentina. Grant him to see fruit from his labors, lives changed by the gospel. Keep him safe and use him, we pray. And now, Father, we thank you that Jesus taught us that when we pray, we should say, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This time I'm going to ask that our worship team come and lead us in some great songs celebrating the resurrection. All right, let's have everybody stand, if you would, please. And we're going to offer up what the Bible calls spiritual sacrifices from our lips to the Lord. Are we not? Oh, okay, good.
Everybody loves what Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But even more, when he said, it, was, it is finished. Amen. Hallelujah.
I almost feel like we should sing that again. Yeah. All right. I'm not the only one? Okay. Is that okay? Sorry. My every wish is their command.
so good to us. Our God is so good to us. Okay, you may be seated. Uh, children's Church starts, so you can, if you would take your children to the narthex for that. Let's put our hearts together and I'd like to pray as we open up God's word for our time together today. Let's pray. O oh Lord, our God and our Heavenly Father, it is good for us to be here today. And we do look forward to that day when heaven and earth will come together and you will regenerate the entire cosmos and in the new heavens and on the new earth there will never ever again be a cemetery because you have conquered sin and death and the grave give us wisdom and insight and understanding as we take some time now and think about the ramifications of your coming into this world, the redeemer of your beloved people. And may each and every one of us join in that people, the new people of God, through faith in you, Lord Jesus. Help us to hear, give us faith to believe, and may we rejoice. No matter how our days go, no matter what we face in this life, may we continue to rejoice and praise you for you have overcome the grave and you said it is finished and we believe that with all our hearts in the name of your son father jesus christ amen, amen. there was a movie i enjoyed and in the scene in one of the scenes the first time i saw the movie it really struck me because i guess something that was true about me personally as a young guy there's, there's a boy of about 11 years of age, and it's at night, and everything's very quiet, and they're having a conversation. And, and, the, and it sounds like this, this young boy is confiding in this adult a great struggle, a great concern, a great fear that he had inside. And, and here's, here's how the dialogue went. The boy says, Bob... Are you afraid of death? Bob says, yeah. The boy says, me too. There's no way out of it. You're going to die. I'm going to die. It's going to happen. And what difference does it make if it's tomorrow or 80 years? Much sooner in your case, Bob. Do you know how fast time goes? I was six just yesterday. Bob says, me too. <laughs> I'm going to die. You're going to die. What else is there to be afraid of? Then, of course, somebody, one, one of them makes some funny remark and they break up laughing. But in that scene, the first time I sat through that movie, that struck deeply within me. Because there was a time when I was a kid and I was lying in bed and I think somebody, some relative of ours had just died. And I, I was thinking, what does this mean? There is this thing called death. And I didn't like it. It, it scared me. It was frightening to me. And, and I, just, I just didn't know what to do about it. And I don't know if this happens to most people. It'd be interesting to take a survey and find out if it, if it ha how many of you something like this has happened. But when it struck me, that, that thought, that realization, it seemed to me that death was the biggest thing of all. 
I mean, I didn't, I didn't, I believed in God, but it didn't click. Anything about God didn't click with me at that time when I was that young. Death seemed altogether inevitable and unchangeable and inescapable, the one absolute reality for everyone, all of us. But where where really is it? And then I listened recently to an interview uh, with Ray Comfort. I don't know if you've ever heard of Ray Comfort. He's probably most well known for his on the street interviews. And uh, he's an amazing guy. I wish I had uh, his patience and his personality and, and his, his love for people. He started what's called Living Waters Ministry. And uh, it's just a great uh, ministry to look up and check out because I think it'll really help you as a believer. Uh, and if you're not a believer, listen to his on the street interviews. They're on YouTube and you can find them just by doing a search. Um, before he was a Christian, I didn't know this, Uh, He was really enjoying life. He was a young man, started a business, very successful business, and he spent his his time doing his business and enjoying that and surfing. He was quite a surfer. And he had a dog. He really loved this dog. And he would go here and there, take his dog with him, and he and his dog were very good friends. And one day his dog lit out ran off from him, and he cried out to his dog to come back, but it was too late. The dog was struck by a car, and he was mortally injured. He picked him up, carried him off to the vet, but there was really only so much they could do. They tried to save the dog. The dog died. And Ray says, before that time, he never thought about death. It never crossed his mind. He had no thoughts about it. And that, the death of that dog brought to him the realization, I'm going to die. And what does all this matter? Surfing, business, success, friends, enjoying life. What does it matter? I'm going to die. And it's going to be all over. And I won't even know that I ever lived. And so God worked in the death of his beloved dog to bring Ray to a place where his heart was opened to the gospel and he came to believe in Jesus Christ. And look what a great ministry he's had ever since, ever since then. And again, I don't know how many people experience this. Maybe just Ray and me. I don't know. And that little guy in the movie. Um, but a- after that time, in my case, every so often I would think about it. I'm going to die. You know, I, 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 didn't off- I didn't really like driving by cemeteries because it would remind me. And, uh, of course, I, used, I got into a lot of partying and living life. And, and sometimes I think all that I did back then was to, to get away from this thought, to get away from this dark cloud that I found hanging over me, the inevitable, the unchangeable, the inescapable fact of the end of my existence. And what am I going to do about it? So I like sort of, was kind of running away from it. Um, but I don't know how clearly I thought about this at that time, and, uh, but I would like to raise the question now that I know the Lord and I have a whole different take on this, but why is there death anyway? I mean, did you ever wonder why we die? Let's say before you were a Christian, if you're a Christian now, you can say, oh yeah, I know all about that. Wait, wait a minute. Why can't we keep on living? I used to think about that too. Why does it have to be this way? I used to look at trees Now, I was never a tree hugger, like they say, but with a certain amount of longing, you're going to live way beyond me. But I didn't want to be a tree because they didn't seem to do much. (laughs) They more or less stationary. And I I did enjoy living life and going here and going there. So I I kind of envy trees, but I really didn't want to be a tree. Um, But that was a question that I now have an answer for, and I wonder if it would make sense to you. The answer. And let me start by saying this. The answer in scripture in a big and general way is that there was a rupture, a cosmic rupture in the universe. And as a result of that cosmic rupture, there is now death in God's creation. Not because he made it a creation for there to be death, but because of this cosmic rupture. 
Now, I want, to, I want you to see this, and let's take a look at the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 2. And Genesis chapter 1, you have the, uh, the big picture of creation. God creates the world six days, rests on the seventh. And then in Genesis 2, he zooms in and he takes a look at um, what his creation is all about. And it starts uh, in the very beginning of Genesis 2, but we won't read the whole chapter, but look at a couple of verses here. Verse 7, Genesis 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now, different translations say different things. I would prefer to say man became a living person. A person in a sense that nothing else that was living was quite like. But notice this. It's as though God being the potter, we being the clay, lovingly and affectionately reached down and drew from his creation this substance out of which he made the first human being and then breathed life into that human being so he becomes a living person. And from that one person, Adam, all of us come from that one person, even Eve, because God later makes Eve out of Adam. So it all started with Adam, the first man. That's very important for you to remember. The Bible says that God made all of us, and he began with one man. He made Adam, and out of Adam came Eve. Then he says, be fruitful and multiply. And the only way to do that was an Adam and an Eve could be fruitful and multiply. And, and the other thing I want you to see is what God says about this here in verses 8 and following, Genesis 2, 8. So it says, the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, the famous Garden of Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight. So there's beauty in creation and good for food. God's provided for us. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So there's about three or four things there. But notice the, the two trees especially mentioned, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now here is a, what could be called a probation set up. What's Adam gonna do now that he lives in God's world, in God's garden? Uh, back to that in a second. Now verse 10, a river went out of Eden to water the garden. So there's always gonna be, um, there's always gonna be plenty of water, plenty of growth, plenty of trees, plenty of, 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 there's going to be a flourishing of the earth. I can put it that way. Verse 11, the name of the first is Pishon. It is the one which skirts the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. Um, the gold of that land is good. Bdellium and the onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Hittichel. It is the one which goes toward the east of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates. Now, some of this is still visible in the Middle East. Some of it has changed, I think, because of the flood. Um, but just mention that as in passing. Then verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden, notice this, to tend and keep it, or to tend and to guard it. So here is God and man together. And, and God makes the first man like a priest. He's to tend and garden He's to tend and guard the garden where God and man will be together, dwelling together. So it's like a holy temple, but notice God and man are both in the temple. Whereas a little bit later on, God's in the temple and only one man once a year can go inside where God is. So, so that's the setting here. So there's perfect relationship, perfect harmony between God and the man and then he's going to give the man Eve so there's this perfect relationship in this perfect world um let's see is there some more I want I want uh, you to, to see here yeah look at 16 verse 16 and the Lord God commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden you may freely eat 
But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, here comes the probation, the test. You shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. All right, so let's, let's summarize what we've got here. God made the universe for us. Now, that's no little thing. Because we are so stuck on our naturalistic evolutionary view of things in, a, in the world... We don't think of it like that. But the Bible says that God created the universe for us. That's generosity. Adam, next I want to say, Adam was the beginning of all of us. We all go back to Adam. Of course, I know this flies in the face of much that goes by the name of science today. But just hear me out. Just follow me out on this. And then... I'd like to emphasize the first point by saying God gave us everything. Notice that there's nothing here that we gave ourselves. There's nothing here that we made for ourselves. It was all freely and generously given to us by God. For our enjoyment forever, there's the good land, the beautiful trees growing, the amazing creatures that Adam goes on to name in a little bit here, which we're not going to be able to do that. But more glorious and amazing that I never knew for so many years of my life, for 20-some years of my life, never knew this. Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Look, listen to this. Then God said, now here's the sixth day of creation. He's finishing his work. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Now listen to this. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Everybody listen. Male and female, he created them. We are all men and women made in the image of God. We equally bear the glory and dignity of God. It's so glorious. Then it says, then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. And he says, it, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So God makes everything for us, freely gives it to us, and puts us in charge of his creation. Talk about generosity and responsibility. It's just so amazing that you find this teaching in, in the Old Testament, which so many people have set aside as, as I don't want to hear that book. I don't, I don't want anything to do with that. And yet, this is this is saying that God puts man at the highest level, men and women together. Now the big question then at this point is, God is a person, Adam is a person. Adam is in a very high position, but he'll never be God, right? So the big question is, would Adam love the one who gave him everything? Would he love the one who put him in charge of all creation? What's Adam going to do with his highly favored and privileged position? That's the question in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Who do I love? Who do I trust? Who do I believe in? Who do I know where I came from, why I'm here, who I am, what my meaning is? What's life all about? We can't get that from ourselves because you're just going to die and whatever you think and choose and achieve is going to die. But if God is God and he made us for himself so that we can live for him and live forever so that all that we accomplish in this life in the name of Jesus, then it means something forevermore. We mean something. We are worth something. We are not just other living creatures running around, just bigger microbes than the rest of the microbes on earth. And what was Adam's answer? No. 
I want to do what I want to do. I want to be who I want to be. I want to go my own way. Don't need you. I can handle it. I'll take it from here. That's what I mean by the cosmic rupture that took place when Adam, the first man, rebelled against God and decided, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to go with what I want to do. I mean, it just sounds to me just so crazy, but that's only now because I'm a Christian. And I look back to my life before I was a Christian, that's what I was. That's who I was. That's the way I lived. I mean, I believed in God even back in those days. But I thought to myself, hey, you know, God's got his place and very important. You know, there wouldn't be anything if it wasn't for him. That's really great, important. Every once in a while I need him, I'll call on it. But basically, I'm going to live my life my way. And I thought it was perfectly good, perfectly fine. In fact, I thought, I mean, I'm a mature person. You know, he made me have a mind so I can figure things out. I can know what I'm all about, what I'm going to do. You know, folly, I know now. I, I look back and see that, absolutely. But that's what happened. And then Romans chapter 5, please look at this. Paul the Apostle says, now... Let me talk to you about what happened that day when Adam decided that he could be God rather than God. So the cosmic rupture, the relationship between God and his beloved Adam and Eve, that was shattered. And man's image, that was shattered. So man is no longer what he was intended to be. Death basically is the proof that you and I are not the way we're supposed to be. Something has gone dreadfully wrong. The world is not the way it's supposed to be. And the Bible gives, I think, the best explanation for it. I've learned, I've heard a lot of other explanations, um, a lot of other faiths and traditions, but this one makes the most sense. And, and so, boom. So Romans 5, verse 12, Paul says, now let me talk about what happened back then. He says, therefore... Just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin. That's why we die. And thus death spread to all men. Now listen to this, because all sinned. Now Adam, the first man, we come, all of us come from him. He was our representative. So the guy's going to play a football game. So the captains go out to the, to the ref, right? And they toss a coin. What? They, they toss a coin, right? And then one guy says heads or, or tails, and then they decide whether he's going to kick or receive. The captain of the team is representing the whole team. If he says we're going to kick, the team's going to kick. If he says we're going to receive, the, king's going to re the team's going to receive. There's not going to be an argument. There's a similar sense in which that's the way it was when Adam, the first man, made that fateful and fatal choice. And so all of us now are, are included in that fall because one man sinned and death entered into the world through that man's choice and so did sin. Now, that's the bad news, the really bad news. But let's take a look at something else here. Look at verse 18, Romans chapter 5, verse 18. Therefore, as through one man's offense, Adam's sin, judgment came to all men, all human beings, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, all human beings, resulting in justification of life. See, there's two men here. Adam sinned, all of us went down. The captain of the team, boom. But we have another Adam, a second man. It's Jesus Christ. He was born of a virgin because all of us are born in sin. So he was born of a virgin without sin. So he could be a new man and head up a new race of human beings who believe in Jesus and we're washed and we're cleansed and we're born again and we belong to God. We're adopted into God's family as his children. And this, this justification of life means 
that when Jesus Christ was born into this world without sin and he lived his life loving God and loving all of his brothers and sisters and loving his enemies and he fulfilled God's holy will, he did what you and I have failed to do. So his righteousness becomes our righteousness when we put our faith in him. His death is our death where our sins are paid for. When he was put into the grave, that was the end of death for you and for me. That was the end of sin condemning you and me. And when he broke out of the grave in that new life, that, that holy and righteous life that would never ever end, that was your life coming to expression through Jesus Christ. And once you put your faith in Jesus Christ, all that Christ did and all that Christ is now is yours freely, just as free as God gave Adam everything on that first day. That's who Jesus is. He counters what Adam did. So, so I'll read just a little bit more here. He says in uh, verse 19, For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners so also by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. You see how it works? See, that's why works cannot save you. Because you were already in terrible trouble when Adam sinned. Because you were in Adam when he sinned. Now, you ask me, how does that work? I, I'm there's theological wording for it, philosophical wording for it. You call it corporate solidarity. How do you like that one? Um, the idea is that God somehow, in his design, looks at Adam and he makes his choice and we're all making the choice. That's why we can all believe in Jesus and because of his choice, we can all be saved by that one man, Jesus. So by one man, sin death by one man forgiveness and life everlasting so we we can only be saved we can only be reconciled to God we can only be sure of what's going to happen when we die when we put our faith in Jesus Christ it's good for you to do good things I'm all for it but it cannot save you it cannot earn your salvation it just won't do because when Adam sinned, we all came, became corrupted. That's why you do things that you shouldn't do. That's why sometimes you do things you know you shouldn't do, and you really maybe don't want to do it, but you do it anyhow. That's why none of us can look back over our lives and say, you know, I've always done the right thing. And even times when I do the right thing, I don't feel like doing the right thing. I do it because, well, I'm supposed to. But... That means I, I really wasn't doing the right thing out of love. Because what's the great commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I think love has a component of feeling in it and passion, don't you? That when I love God, I, I want to love him. And when I obey God, I want to obey him. And I want to do this. And I don't want to do what's wrong. But it's not like that in the reality. Now, of course, one day when we will see him, all that will be gone. However far we've grown or not grown as believers following Jesus, the, the day you see him, that distance will shrink to nothing. And we will be completely everything God originally meant us to be. And it's all the work of God. That's why we say you're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. So, so that's, I just wanted to put that before you. So here's another verse. Um, you can look, up, look it up when you get a chance, but I'll just mention it for today. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sin, once for sin, the just or the righteous one for the unrighteous. Adam the unrighteous, Jesus the righteous. That he might bring us to God. He could... Put an end to that cosmic rupture. So I'm not separated from God anymore. God is not against me anymore. He's for me. In fact, how can I not believe that when he sent his own son to die for me? So he was put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit. 
Here's another one, Romans 5, 8. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And remember John the Baptist, what he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's my hope. He's my Savior. He's my Lord. Yes, I do have that in me where I want to do what I want to do. I want to go my own way. I want to be my own person. But you know, I can tell you, you give me a chance, what that led to. And now it's so different because he is good and he is righteous and he loves me and he forgives me when I stumble and mess up. He really loves me and he loves everyone who turns to him and starts to follow him. So Adam, the first man, was the beginning of all of us. And Jesus, the second man, who is the last Adam, is the one who saves all of us when we put our faith in him. So I'm wondering, after hearing all of that, if the thought has ever come to you, I'm going to die, you're going to die, my parents are both gone, my dear grandmother and grandfather, they're gone, they're all gone, my sister Pam died when she was 11, they're all gone. But no, Jesus says no. The grave does not have the last say. I do, and I win. And if you'll call upon his name, his victory will be yours. And you call upon his name, his work on the cross, where he said it is finished, will be yours. Forgiven of sins, given everlasting life, and one day we will rule and reign with Christ. If you want to know more about that, I'd be glad to talk to you about that. We just don't have time to go through that today, but it is glorious. And then remember, this is very sobering, I know, but I have that to say it. He will be your savior or Jesus will be your judge. There's no way around it. You're not getting out of this world without facing him. And you can face him today and say, you're my righteous savior. I bow before you. I call upon your name to save me. And you will never be condemned because Christ suffered for you. But if you refuse and you say, I'm going to put it off, or I don't believe that stuff, you will see Jesus one day, but he will be your judge. Most assuredly, Jesus said, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment. But that one has passed from death into life. Truly, truly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Have you heard? Are you alive? Have you come to Christ? Believe in him now and live and live forever. Death is not inevitable. Death is not unchangeable. And death is not inescapable. Only Jesus is. So come to Jesus. So you can say with all the rest of us, can we say this together? Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Hallelujah. Let's pray. And please put your faith in Christ if you haven't done so. I know it might be a fight and a struggle. I want to do what I want to do. I'm going to go. I have plans. I, I, I don't want him to mess up my life. He won't. He won't. He gave us everything in the beginning, and now he's given us his son. Why hold yourself back? Come to Jesus. Oh, Father, we pray. Help us to love you more and more as Brother Skip has prayed, become more and more like Jesus. Lord, be at work in all of our hearts and lives and may we be raised up together with you, Jesus, and made alive and seated with you now and forevermore. We thank you again. You are God's blessed and indescribable gift to us. Thank you. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let me ask you to stand up and uh, we'll sing uh, He is Lord uh, after we receive his blessing. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory throughout, in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all the ages forever and ever. Amen.